Okay. All right. So yeah, we are live. Uh, Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our artist talk with uh, Heidi Greco. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that our virtual artist talk tonight is happening on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Squamish, Katsi, Kwotlam, Sinyamu, Slaver Chus, and Musqueam First Nations. And we are very grateful for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So tonight, uh, we have Heidi Greco here with us. Um, I would like to introduce you uh, to, um, to the audience. Um, she is a Surrey Civic treasurer and writer and editor who offers workshops on editing and writing various kinds of poetries. And her books have been published by publishing houses such as Caitlin and Anvil Press. Um, she also is uh, affiliated with our Arts Council, has been a president with Samyamo Arts, right, Heidi? I, I was a director uh, for two Di terms. Director, okay. So I don't um, need a promotion. <laughs> And uh, we would also like to thank uh, our sponsors for this artist talk, the Writers Union of Canada and the Ca Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, thank you very much. And Alexander um, is uh, our marketing coordinator who has helped to put this event together. Mm -hmm. He's also helping us to stream this uh, event right now live on YouTube. So thank you very much, Alexander, for mm -hmm. your help. And now over to you, Heidi. Hello, and thank you so much, Uli, and, and thank you, Alexander. Um, you did so much work in the background, and I know you're doing it today as well. Um, I, too, am on the territory of the Semiamu Nation, land that also remembers the now extinct Nicomaco people. And I also extend my thanks not only to Semiamu Arts for taking on responsibility for this project, but to the Writers' Union of Canada and the Canada Council for the Arts for providing financial support. Okay. So, so yeah, oh, we, really? we don't really have like a structure. Um, I was uh, going to ask you, um, Heidi, uh, in your uh, wonderful book and uh, just for our audience, uh, we know that not everyone watched the movie. And uh, so we don't want to give too much away about the movie and not too much away about Heidi's book, but we do want to discuss uh, what it is about and maybe raise some curiosity and have a, a lively a discussion. There's also going to be a Q&A uh, towards the end around quarter to um, quarter to uh, six. And we will also announce the winner of the uh, Instagram draw. Uh, somebody will win tonight a copy of Heidi's book that is coming out. Alexander will also post the links to Anvil Press and to Heidi's um, uh, uh, online website uh, where you can see all of her books and also order directly from the um, publisher. Um, so Heidi, I was fortunate enough to have the advanced copy and yeah. I uh, read uh, through spe speed read uh, through it within a few days. Um, and I really liked how you mentioned that um, you the movie when you watched it in the 70s when it came out, um, it didn't really caught your interest the first time, it was the second time. And then you elaborate about it later in the book. So would you like to um, talk about that? Certainly, that would be great. And I do remember the first time I went, I, I went alone and I was a bit dazzled when I came out of the theater. And I knew that I would have to see it again because there were so many elements of it that just kept flashing through my mind. But, um, I'll just read a little section that, that tells a little bit about that. And of the many scenes that kept appearing in my mind, more than any other scene, I found myself going back to the point where Maud and Harold are on a less than luxurious seaside beach of sorts. They're perched on a log with the sunset aglow as a background. The beauty of that golden hour in juxtaposition to creaking clanks of machinery and sounds from a nearby freeway 
along with bits of garbage strewn about, that's the scene that lingered most. When the seagulls fly by, Maud tells Harold how Dreyfus, exiled on Devil's Island, took pleasure in viewing those same birds reeling above him and how he called them glorious birds, a term she still chooses to use for them. Within days after that first viewing, I found myself feeling the need not only to see the film again, but to share it with someone. The thing was, I wasn't in any kind of relationship, but that didn't mean I hadn't been looking. A long-haired guy in my physics class had been the object of some focused staring on my part. Not that he ever turned around and looked back. I had it in my mind that I needed to get to know him. All I knew about him was his name, Roy. And of course, what the back of his head looked like. Okay, thank you. So you mentioned uh, Glorious Birds and that scene that you just uh, quoted out of your book is also the, exactly the cover. Mm -hmm. And I would like to talk with you more about the cover um, sure. of your book. Uh, it's very striking. And you worked with Derek, I think is his yes, name? Yes, Derek uh, Van Essen. He's a graphic artist who lives on the Sunshine Coast. And I had worked with him in the past because he did the cover for an anthology that I was editor of. And this scene on the front cover, Glorious Birds, is the scene in the film where Maud and Harold uh, look at these birds and where she explains how they can be beautiful to someone who doesn't realize what they are. Uh, the addition of the sunflower came when uh, I was able to put my two cents in on the back cover of the book. That's actually a photo that I took of a giant whack of, of sunflowers. And happiest of all is that Derek in his brilliance was able to Photoshop the medallion, which is the same kind of medallion that Harold makes for Maud. Of course, we couldn't find one of those. We were all trolling secondhand stores looking for them. They used to be at carnivals, like at the PE, um, and it was just a machine. I think it cost a quarter, and you put your money in, and then you turned a knob so that letters came up and it stamped them down. And this one in particular says, as does the one in the film, Harold loves Maud. So I was thrilled that Derek was able to create that and use all those elements in the cover front and back. And if you can just look at the front cover, um, yeah. what I find really striking, I watched the movie, I, I watched it in a grade uh, eight and then I rewatched it uh, a few weeks ago uh, mm -hmm. just to refresh my memory. And that scene actually really stuck in my head. And I think most of us probably who watched the movie um, because, and we don't want to give you know, too much away. But no, you can't tell the secrets of that scene. Yeah, no, but it's <laughs> such an intimate moment, right? It is. It is. And what I like, how Derek um, did the visual of this cover, and this is just my personal interpretation. You can maybe, um, you know, say yes or no. But I like that there is, it's age blind and mm -hmm. almost gender blind. You cannot see, you know, the gender and nor the age. You just see the law between those two individuals. Right, and that ambiguity is indeed uh, there. Possibly, it had something to do with everybody wanting to be very sure that there were no copyright issues. But I also believe that that ambiguity that he created was intentional and and very very workable for our time when we're starting to finally realize that uh, we're all alike. Yes, beautiful. 
Okay, I'm just gonna stop the screen share. Okay, thanks. Back. Um, Thank you for doing that. But it's a very striking cover. We we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't judge the book by the cover, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> it um, does help to have a beautiful cover. You mentioned just now about the back and how you uh, try to find this uh, medal that uh, Harold loves uh, more. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you were describing, uh, one can see that you did extensive research, mm -hmm. uh, just backtracking uh, everything. And um, you, in your book, uh, it, when, when you read the book, one can really see it is very unpretentious. It's very down to earth but to the point, and one can see that you did thorough research. And I'm curious to know, you know, all these people are dead. How did you find all this information, especially Hal Ashby um, and uh, Colin Higgins? How, how do you, you know, approach finding all this information and putting it together? And in this regard, also, you're a versatile um, author. You write poetry, fiction, nonfiction. You wrote now about a movie. Um, how, if there is an author in the audience who's young and, you know, really, really aspiring, what is your advice to them to write about a movie where everyone is dead and you cannot ask and interview them anymore? Well, imagination certainly comes into play, but you're absolutely right, Uli. A lot of research went into this, but because this was a year when I couldn't be going to the local jail and doing workshops, and when I couldn't be going to the Carnegie Center and doing workshops, and when I couldn't, 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 I had to find something to do at home. And this film is something that has been in my head, obviously, for a long time. I first saw it in 1972, uh, when it was first playing in, a little, a, a few theaters here and there. I'm not sure how I've cottoned on to it, but um, it's a film I've loved for so long. And I would say that it's a film that I've always had a passion for. And whatever you might be researching, whether it's a film or whether it's a person or, or whether it's just a big subject that you want to study, the moon, I don't know. Um, it has to be something that you really care about to engage yourself enough to track down all that you can find. Now, I was very lucky to have help from librarians, specifically librarians at the, at the White Rock of the Fraser Valley Regional Library, even though the pandemic was on and they, they weren't really supposed to be doing interlibrary loans. They helped me track down books that were oh, all over the place. I mean, I would have had to drive to Northern British Columbia to get at some of these books. So I say librarians will always help you. And yes, it was a complication that so many people were dead. I wasn't able to interview any of them, but because they were filmmakers, a lot of other people had made films of them and I was able to access many of, of those items thanks to the internet. I, I didn't have to go anywhere. I was able to do 98% of my research from home. And looking back at my sources, I see that I initially sought out the screenplay by Colin Higgins in 2017. So this idea for writing about this book had been in my mind for some time, but the lockdown gave me a reason to find a project that I could really engage myself in, um, or I probably would have just played solitaire all year. <laughs> Good point. So you used a difficult situation such as COVID and turned it into an opportunity and out came something productive. Well, um, I, I like to think of it that yes. way. Um, I, you know, I do kind of call it my, my pandemic project. So would you say uh, for the young audience here who want to also write and publish a book, they should uh, use this opportunity right now to get creative 
Um, and uh, in this regard, I found a quote by Hal Ashby on Instagram. It says, I only hope that we can use all of our creativity and talent towards peace and love. I think in the context of today, peace and love may be inner peace and love for ourselves. Uh, what he said 30, 40 years ago, what do you think? Well, I do think that he was talking about um, world peace, a kind of peace. He said that at a time when the Vietnam War was still going on. It's actually what he said when he received his Oscar for editing. He had edited In the Heat of the Night for Norman Jewison, the Canadian director. And when he won the Oscar, there's actually kind of a funny story about it. I want to see if I can find it. Um, it uh, I have too many things marked in here. Here we go. Ashby's work on In the Heat of the Night earned him an Oscar for editing, the only Oscar he would ever win. It's close to legend that he nearly missed the Academy Awards ceremony. Director and graphic designer Pablo Ferro relates how he was with Hal far from where the awards were being held and that he reminded Hal that he'd better get down to Santa Monica for the ceremony. He goes on to say that the two of them had barely arrived when Hal was called to the stage by presenter Dame Edith Evans. By the way, Dame Edith Evans was one of the people considered for Maud. Ooh, Ruth Gordon, Ruth Gordon. <laughs> Ashby's acceptance speech was short, a repetition of what his friend and mentor Haskell Wexler had said when he'd won an Oscar the previous year. I only hope that we can use all of our talents and creativity towards peace and love. And even his daughter, who grew up estranged from him, because Ashby was only 19 when she was born and, and it was, he was not ready to be a father, but she loved him. And as an adult, she comments about him. He was all about peace and love. Uh, in Coming Home, Ashby makes one of his cameo appearances and it's so appropriate because there he is making the peace symbol. And uh, um, Heidi, you mentioned that his daughter was uh, estranged. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, we don't want to give too much away, but in your book, you do mention the absence of the father. Um, and then you told me, but you did research about that. And mm -hmm. do you want to elaborate on sure. the father? Harold in the film, Harold and Maud, has no father. And the only reference to him in the film is made at a fancy dinner that they're having. And Harold's not so nice mother makes reference to the father and says, oh, he was floating nude down the Seine. He was, was such a, um, Harold is kind of like him. That's the only mention that's made of Harold's father in the whole film. In the screenplay and in the novelization of the screenplay, Higgins uh, involves the father a bit more. He mentions uh, that he that the man died uh, while trying to photograph parrots in Polynesia someplace. So we know that he's dead. Uh, and there's also a scene where Harold is being questioned by the psychiatrist and he talks about his father and says that he wishes he could have known him and he would have shown him his things and that, uh, so it's a, it's a lack and a missing him. But I think that this was also part of the appeal for Ashby because he lost his father, many say it was a suicide, um, when he was only 12. So this fatherless figure, um, and if you see other of Ashby films, it's something to watch for because 
rarely is there a father on the scene. And how does that reflect in the story, this lack of a father figure for the main protagonist? Well, his mother certainly attempts to fill his life with surrogate fathers. Her brother is a general in the US Army and she sends Harold to him to get advice on how to be a man and, and tries to get him joined up in the army. Uh, Harold's psychiatrist is a man um, played by a, an actor named G. Wood, who if you watch early MASH episodes shows up as General Hammond. It's the voice that gives him away. Um, and of course she, the Chasen family, Harold and his mother, they have all the accoutrements of Catholicism. So a priest is also involved, um, mainly giving what seems to be pretty bad, unrealistic advice. So surrogate fathers appear, but no real father appears. Mm -hmm. Would you say, because there are references to Freud, Freudian, there's also um, this, you know, theory of Eros and Thanatos, the love and the death, and, um, but also maybe that, and that somebody said that I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that it's true, but would you say there's Oedipus complex in the movie that, you know, he, his dad is not there? And his well, mom. the psychiatrist who, who has in his office a picture of Sigmund Freud hanging on the wall behind him. Um, he, in analyzing Harold, especially when he realizes that Harold is falling in love with this very much older woman, uh, claims that uh, while it's common for a young man to perhaps wish to sleep with his mother, Harold's problem is that he seems to wish to sleep with his grandmother. And that's about as Freudian as anything gets in this film. <laughs> Maybe also making a little bit fun of uh, Freud series. Um, in this oh, regard. I think that just about everything in this film is is poking a bit of fun. The whole dark humor of it is um, well, it, some of it is is quite grim, but it's it's always with a a, a, a light hearted. Uh, a, a lighthearted air to it. And, you know, we leave the film being uplifted, I believe. I agree. The peace and love, I think that's an important component. It gives you hope for love and for peace. Mm -hmm. um, again, we don't want to give too much away. I know, it's hard to talk <laughs> it about. It is, yeah, film the movie is amazing, the book is happen. amazing. Um, yes, and uh, yes, and earlier in your description, how you found the movie in this little theater, you also in your book, you mentioned that initially the book wasn't actually a success. And then you compare it to The Graduate that was um, released uh, a few years earlier. And The Graduate was actually a big hit. Um, it says here, highest grossing film in 1967. Uh, uh, why do you think, and nowadays, no question, Harold and Maud is a cult classic. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think initially, in, when it was released in 1971, it wasn't so popular? Well, for one thing, it had the traditional um, pre-Oscar late December release. And uh, it was released the same time as some big competitors whom of course I cannot say at this moment, um, but it was not seen as appropriate. It was not seen as, as lighthearted as it is. People saw the dark side of it and it didn't go along with what they wanted for a Christmas film. Um, they were looking for Disney happy up movies. And this one did not appear to be up enough. And the whole scenario of the romance between a very young man and a very much older woman 
did not sit well with people. And it closed after only a week or two in most theaters. And it was only a few months later that it started coming around again when people, I don't know if they had stopped holding their breath or what, but then it started being shown. And it, there was a theater in Minneapolis that showed it continuously for a year and a half. Um, and it was events such as that that really helped it build to this peak cult status that, that we know it is now. But it took a full decade for it to even recoup the costs of, of making it. So it was a, it, it was a slow learner. Mm -hmm. But The Graduate was also about uh, an affair between an old lady and a young guy. Well, relatively so. Um, I think that Anne Bancroft, who played the older woman in that, was in her mid-30s. And Dustin Hoffman, who was supposed to be just turned 21, very similar to Harold's age, uh, was actually 28 or 29. Oh. So there were really only a few years difference between the two of them. But because Mrs. Robinson was the mother of the man whom Benjamin Braddock, the Dustin Hoffman character eventually wants to be with, um, it, it was a generational thing and it was and Mrs. Robinson was a friend of Benjamin Braddock's parents. And uh, so many elements of discomfort came into play that, that weren't in uh, Harold and Maude. But I do think that Colin Higgins, film student at UCLA, no doubt watched The Graduate many times and took some substantial clues from it in making his master's thesis, which was his script for Harold and Maude. Must have gotten an oh, A plus. Wheels within wheels. <laughs> Pardon me, Uli, I'm sorry. I spoke no, that's over okay. You. I said he must have gotten an A plus for his uh, screen. Uh, well, I thesis. hope so. And, you know, it, it uh, he happened to get a job as the pool boy, the Aww. pool cleaner for a family where the man was involved in films and he showed the screenplay to the wife of the man who was involved in screenplays. Yeah. And uh, she loved it, handed it to him. And that was how the screenplay got to Paramount and Paramount Pictures got it to Ashby. So it, you know, it was, it was a series of wonderful coincidences and good luck that this film came about at all. There you go to all you uh, young, inspiring uh, screen players, just show your script to as many people as possible. There you go, absolutely. <laughs> Serendipity yeah. is a major part of your success. <laughs> or get a, a miserable job, working for somebody who is very well connected. <laughs> yes, sounds like it, yeah. Um, so uh, to, to uh, come to the next point uh, of our uh, discussion, uh, the graduate, uh, in the graduate, uh, the soundtrack is uh, very important. Uh, same is with uh, Harold and Maud. And in your book, you do mention you have several references of uh, the soundtrack, Cat Stevens songs. Um, I have to admit, I was not familiar who uh, Cat Stevens is before uh, I read your book and uh, uh, paid uh -huh. attention to the soundtrack. He's an amazing uh, artist. Uh, since we are an arts council, what role does the arts uh, play towards uh, conveying the message of the movie um, through the help of the arts to the audience? Okay, Uli, I just want to be clear. Do you mean the art of the music or do you mean the art of all the various pieces of art that, that are in the film? Good question, Heidi. Yeah, oh. There are lots of references to various art forms. Why don't we start with the soundtrack? Okay, well, uh, 
like the graduate which had the um, the sounds of silence and the simon garfunkel music that film was the first one that ever used coordinated music all the way through by a popular group up until then um, if we think Breakfast at Tiffany's, for example, it's Henry Mancini music throughout. It's almost all instrumental. Uh, orchestral music was the mode of the day for films. And The Graduate changed things by using popular music from two albums that had already been released. So they were already in the social psyche. People were familiar with them. And Ashby did the same thing with the Cat Stevens music. He hadn't even finalized a deal with Cat Stevens, but while they were filming and they'd show the dailies, he'd play the Cat Stevens music and started to see how it could be integrated into the action of the film. And then the lyrics of the words, uh, so many of them tie in even in a kind of philosophical uh, manner with some of the ideas behind the film. So it really was a natural fit. And Ashby went to England and did his best to convince Cat Stevens that he wanted to use the music from these two albums. And he said he needed a couple more songs and Cat Stevens complied and gave him a couple more songs, but they apparently weren't ready and Ashby used them anyway. And as it worked out, it was, it was all a good, good thing. Um, Elton John almost did the music for it. We hear um, that's harder to track down and Elton John did not respond to my emails. You actually <laughs> emailed him? Oh, I, I tried contacting all kinds of people, Uli. It was, um, the, the most discouraging one, of course, was Bud Court, because he's just like unfindable. He's one of the few who are still alive from this film, but um, he's, uh, I don't know, maybe he'll hear this uh, interview of ours and he'll come out of the walls and, and join us for the next time we talk about the book. But um, no, and, and tried really hard to, to have an interview with Cat Stevens, but that did not work either. He is very private these days and um, no, did, did not succeed, but um, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, I am actually curious what he thought of uh, Harold and Maud. Is there any record of that, his opinion about the movie? Uh, he, I don't recall finding an opinion about the movie, but he did finally acknowledge that particularly the two songs in it, one of them is the, if you want to sing out, sing out, you know, kind of the theme song for the film. That was one of the two that wasn't from these previous albums and wasn't studio polished. And Cat Stevens admitted that the rawness of it the rawness of those songs enhanced them and made them better for the film. Mm -hmm. So we did come around. That's good to know. Yeah. There is also, and you uh, do mention the classic mu um, music, Strauss. Mm -hmm. um, there's like this juxtaposition between a modern advanced uh, critical music and then this uh, classic traditional and the movie is full of juxtapositions, right? There is a bourgeoisie, the establishment, mm -hmm. and then, you know, this free spirit. Um, there's old, there's new um, mm -hmm. clashes with um, authorities. Mm -hmm. Actually, some scenes did remind me, I don't know if you, uh, if you read or listened uh, to Malcolm Gladwell's How to Talk to Strangers. Uh, it, it just recently came out. And I know it, but I don't know it well enough. I did not read the whole book. But yeah, there is like, I think if yeah. you if you do listen, you may think, ah, okay, and then watch the movie. Hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I can see. So yeah. yeah, but this movie is amazing because uh, there are so many different topics packed in mm -hmm. the movie. And in your book, you do address so many of these 
different aspects. How did you manage in less than 200 pages to compile such a complex movie, you know, without making it sound boring? And really, I, and I think I told you I enjoyed reading it because it's such a light breeze. It's a, it's a heavy topic. Um, you could have gone all academic and you know, put so many series in it, but you didn't. How did you manage to keep it light? I think it's just the nature of who I am, Uli. I am not an academic. I barely have a bachelor's degree. I am, um, you know, I'm sort of meat and potatoes kind of person. And uh, so it all went in and it, it came out just the way we would speak, I hope. Um, I'm glad if it's a smooth read and, and the textuality of it doesn't get in the way. I'm thinking though about um, the contrast that you mentioned. For example, when Harold's mother does her swimming exercise in the morning, it, this classical music fills the air and she seems to stroke the water in rhythm and with it. And then uh, to contrast her with Maud, who plunks away at a piano and sings in an almost off key mode, something that apparently bothered Cat Stevens initially that she wasn't singing his song quite right. Um, these are the contrasts that make this film work. The great big house that Harold lives in, the great big gated home that he lives in, filled with uh, religious symbols and, and crucifixes and candles, um, darkness, uh, heavy curtains and murals, and then the light that is everywhere in, in Maud's little rail car. In the screenplay, Maud was supposed to live in an apartment, but an apartment seemed too boring and dull and restrictive to Ashby. So he and Michael Haller, well, his, his art director, Michael Haller, should have so much credit. Um, they found this old rail car near the beach and decorated the whole thing. And, and Haller not only filled it with Buddhas and plants and Maud's inventions and Maud's paintings. Um, but he apparently put things into all the cupboards and drawers that like there was a sewing kit in, in a cupboard someplace. The things that you would really find in a house, even though they, they didn't appear in the film, they weren't used but it was all to add to the homey atmosphere of it. And the contrast between this big, fancy, pretentious, but cold home that Harold lives in with his mother, and then this warm, ramshackle, crowded, tumbling kind of place where Maud lives, you know, it's, it is a film of contrasts on so many levels. Very, you uh, just described it very beautifully. And I think now everyone wants to watch the movie. <laughs> I hope so. I, I really do hope so. I mean, this is a book that comes with a warning at the front. Don't read this book if you haven't seen the film because it's just one spoiler after the next. I mean, there's even a scene by scene description that if you didn't see the film, you could go through it and see scene by scene what happens. Um, so, and if you haven't seen it in a really long time, maybe see it again. I was pleased that you watched it again before you read the book or while you were reading the book, Uli. I think that the two enhance each other. You know, they, they go together. I have a last uh, question to you, Heidi. Uh oh. Um, I watched it with a friend and we were, you know, exchanging, um, we were exchanging about our opinions, our impressions in, in the 21st century living during COVID. And my friend said that 
I think uh, this movie has a common uh, feeling among people and men during uh, war eras, existential malaise, not knowing what to do with their lives or if it was worth mm -hmm. living. Um, but he also said he thinks that this feeling of malaise might start happening now with COVID. What is your opinion? Well, it is happening. I mean, um, we know that mental illness is up. We know that uh, the opioid crisis has increased, that unhappiness is, is with us now. Um, we know that domestic violence has increased because people are trapped in their homes. Those of us who are lucky enough to be with a partner who accepts us the way we are, you know, we've been able to get by and our relationships grow, but that has not been the case for everyone. This has been a demanding time um, and malaise is, is a very reasonable word for it. People are lonely, um, people are craving touch. Um, we need to be able to hug again. I recently heard someone say, I don't think we'll ever shake hands again. Now, maybe that indeed is the case because our hands are probably dirty much of the time, but I do hope that we will be able to hug again. I, I really, I really miss that. That's touching, Heidi. I think many of us can relate to that feeling. Okay, so wow, time flies. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, if, if, we, if this is okay with you, Heidi, we would like to open the Q&A. That'd be great. Um, Okay, I just want to announce we had a draw uh, for oh, a copy of Heidi's book. Good. And uh, the winner of uh, the draw is Karen Kruger uh, from White Rock. So congratulations, Karen. Uh, we will get in touch with you. We know where you are. <laughs> Good. And have uh, Anvil Press uh, send a copy of Heidi's book uh, to you. That's so, great. Yeah. Okay. You know, and while you say that Anvil Press is going to send the book, I would encourage people, uh, you know, if this were a quote unquote normal book launch, we would have a book table and we'd be selling books and I'd be signing them. And, you know, we would all be talking and laughing and maybe even having a glass of wine together. I know the wonderful event Semi Arts has always done. Uh, this time, all I can say is go to your local independent neighborhood bookstore and request it, please. Heidi Greco, Glorious Birds, Anvil Press. Um, any of those access points should be enough to help you find it. And don't forget to mention it at your local library. Canadian authors are lucky enough that when our books are found by the great mysterious system in the sky, when they're found at libraries, we get paid. So it's, um, it's a really good thing to suggest to your public library that they order copies too. Oh, okay. That's interesting to know. Yes, please people go to Surrey Library and White Rock Library and ask for Heidi's book. <laughs> please. Yes. All right. Okay. So Alexander has put some questions from the audience together. Oh, good. Uh, first one, Heidi, I really saw similarities between the style of the film and A Clockwork Orange. Oh, the film, gosh. In terms of its dark humor, do you see that and did it enter your process at all? No, it didn't. But that really makes me want to see Clockwork Orange again, because I admit that although I probably saw it maybe three times in my life, it's been a really long time since I saw it. Um, the main character is uh, certainly lost, but I don't feel that he has the kind of perhaps called salvation um, that, that Harold has. I will have to look at that again. Um, what an interesting thought. 
I remember having to read the book Clockwork Orange at university and it was almost uh, impossible to read because Burgess, the author, um, created a special language for it that would be futuristic. And uh, he was some sort of fabulous linguist and totally beyond me. And I think that when I read the book, I thought, I don't think I want to try to see the film again. <laughs> I don't know what the film is about. Is it worth watching, Clockworth Orange? Oh, it, well, it, you need to be prepared for some pretty serious violence, although it's 40 years old violence, so it's probably nothing compared to what we see now. Um, it's a Kubrick film, so it, that kind of says something for it right there. It's strange, full of odd juxtapositions and, wildly interesting music and visuals. That's as okay. far as I'll go with that. All right. It is not a happy film. Not at all, like from beginning to end? Mm -hmm. Not very, not as I recall, but, but perhaps the person who asked the question knows the film better and, and remembers it better than I do. Mm -hmm. But the person who asked the question, if you want to have a follow-up question with Heidi, please feel free to do so. Mm -hmm. The next question, love is a sweet mystery in this film, maybe everywhere. How does Ashby makes all of this feel so innocent? Mm. Gosh, if, if I knew that, I'd, I'd have to make a film too, wouldn't I? <laughs> um, I think that he was very lucky that the script for Harold and Maud came to him. He had made one feature film previously, The Landlord, which oddly also has some parallels to Harold and Maud. It's a young, uh, kind of lost, rich young man who meets oddly a somewhat older woman in his case, she's a black woman, and this causes uh, uh, uproar in his family, who are very white and very uh, snobbish. Um, the woman who plays the mother in that, Lee Grant, got an Oscar for her performance, mm -hmm. uh, and and thanks Ashby at 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 the Academy Awards ceremony. Um, love it's it's the hardest hardest thing in the world to uh to write a poem about it without being sappy it's uh it, it's it's the most wonderful thing to experience but probably the hardest thing to encapsulate in an art form okay thank you do we have more questions, Alexander, or is that it? I actually have one more question to you, Heidi. Sorry. Okay. Yes, um, no, that's fine. In, you dedicated your book to the next Hal Ashby, whoever they may be. I did. That I thought that is so beautiful. Such yeah. a beautiful dedication, and it leaves so much room for imagination. Who do you imagine to be the next Hal Ashby? Well, there are people that we don't know yet, Uli. There are people who um, are now in high school or university. They're the people who are dreaming of becoming filmmakers. They're the people who are wanting to be able to write meaningful films that would change people's lives. Um, Ashby's message throughout all of his films was, yes, peace and love. And anti-war message was huge in, in many of his films. Fortunately, the Vietnam War did end while he was alive, um, but he certainly made strong statements about it in his work. And there clearly are many messages that all of us today need to be speaking about all the threats to the planet, 
I, I can't even begin to list all the causes that are now at hand for us. Um, those are the issues that the next hell Ashby's, whether they be young women, young men, whoever they are, they are the people who will be bringing those to light and showing us ways to learn and deal with them. Hopefully we will meet them in this lifetime. Yes. And, uh, watch the movie, whatever movie it is they are going to make. Mm -hmm. There is another question. Uh, do you see a parallel between the character of Harold and the youth of today? I'm certain that there are parallels between Harold and, and young people today. Um, and parallels are something that merely runs in a similar fashion. It doesn't mean that it has to be a fatherless boy who has a controlling mother. Um, so many of us in those hard, hard teenage and early 20 years don't know where we're going, don't know what we should be doing. Um, the world is so expensive. Uh, so many jobs are being taken over by technology. You know, there are always problems facing young people. And, but the great hope of the world always lies with those very young people who dream answers and who hopefully are brave enough to put those answers forward um, and, and share them with the rest of us. So yes, there are parallels. Um, and as Harold found hope, not only through love, um, I am confident that Harold went on to a, a rich life that it wasn't reliant only on his relationship with Maud. Uh, and I, if I didn't have hope, I mean, my goodness, we'd all just go to sleep and not wake up. Hope is Good what point. we live on. Good point. And the movie surprisingly does give hope. Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. Judd Abatow has a great line about it which I can't pull out of my head and it, it isn't something that I've marked in my book, but he says that it's so life affirming. Okay. So it looks like we are done with the questions uh, in the audience. Heidi, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, Well, I think the fact that Harold and Maude was ahead of its time in a lot of its aspects is one of the reasons that it's still with us today. Um, environmental issues were introduced in it. Um, those anti-war messages were strong in it. Um, even, it, it seems absurd, but computer dating in 1971 was... Uh, <laughs> mentioned in yeah. this in this film in in quite a hilarious uh, manner looking back on it um, but people did not have personal computers people couldn't imagine at that point that you could carry a phone in your hand that you'd be able to uh, link up with somebody uh, that was not conceivable and yet so many of the notions that we carry as every day today were mentioned in this. So in, in a lot of ways, it was, it was envisioning the future. And you mentioned dating. And I want to just add to this conversation um, that and this may for the audience who has not read your book may come like out of the blue. But when you read Heidi's book, you understand what it's about. Um, there was a survey made with uh, match.com that uh, asked participants about whether they feel uh, comfortable if women ask the male out. And 95% um, of the males said they would really love if they are asked out by 
females, however, for whatever reason, only 13% of women feel comfortable asking men out. Even, you know, so we are in the 21st century, the study was done in 2017. So, you know, this might be an encouragement and also after reading Heidi's book for you ladies uh, to ask the men of your dreams out. Or maybe they are not the men of your dreams, but you will not know if you don't ask them out, right, Heidi? There you go. Yeah, no, and I did ask a man to go on a date and I did not live to regret it. Uh, and yet I understand this. Uh, you know, we are vulnerable. We don't want to be want to appear as overly forward. I don't know what our reasons are, but maybe that's one more way that we need to be seeking equality, not being afraid to say, hey, you want to go on a date? Watch the next Harold and Maud. <laughs> okay, we are at the we'll end. We'll look for them. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi, for your participation. Uh, we really enjoyed this lovely talk. And thank you to Alexander for making sure, as always, that the uh, electro, um, technology runs smoothly and everyone can watch the live stream. And thanks to our audience for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed. And please uh, do watch the movie and do read Heidi's book, Highly Recommendable. And yeah, with that, we would like to uh, say bye. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alexander, Uli, uh, all of those of you who came to this Zoom meeting. I'm sorry I'm not on uh, view gallery, but I trust that there are a few of you still there. So thank you very much. You have a good night, Heidi. Bye-bye. Thank you, Uli. You Thanks bye. very much. Bye.